Hello everyone and welcome to our review of The Mystery Method. Today we're going to be looking at chapters 1 and 2 because this is an instruction manual. It is a textbook. It is literally how to get beautiful women into bed. I don't know what I was expecting when I opened the book, but that's what I found. And honestly, honesty in advertising, like, hey, you know, kudos to Mystery for writing down an instruction manual on how to get women into bed. He, uh, he was not lying. It is a step-by-step -step approach. <laughs> so that being said, first few chapters, like I'd say maybe the first four or so, um, it's, it's core concepts, it's terminology, it's vocabulary words. So we're probably not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, once we get into the meat of it, once we get into the structure of the formation of a relationship, then we can slow down a little bit and go on a chapter by chapter basis because there's a lot more information to process at that point. Chapter one, let's see, let me get chapter one up here so that I can actually see it here. Chapter one, the mystery behind Casanova. I'll be perfectly honest, this chapter felt kind of like an advertisement for the rest of the book and his website. Um, it, it was, uh, <sighs> it, it, it was not, it, it took a little while to get, for me at least to get into the stride of the book here. And chapter one was one of those things where when I, I went through before I even suggested reading this book and I read through a bunch of the reviews on the book that people had written and I read through the positive reviews and I read through the negative reviews. A lot of the negative reviews said it feels like a giant advertisement for his website. For me, it didn't seem so much an advertisement for his website as the rest of the book, but it does kind of, there, there was that, that little bit of, but wait, there's more. Um, I could have done without that, but you know, it, it's not like there isn't any substance to it. It just, it seemed a little bit like the first chapter or so, he was just kind of convincing people that they should read the rest of the book. Um, this might or might not be true, but from what I've read online, and again, this might or might not be true, the reason he had a co-author was because when he first started working on the book, he said he was going to do the book, but he kept on kind of not getting, not getting really into it. And he was sort of struggling with getting it written down. So he eventually picked up a, a co-author who kind of helped him. I don't know if he helped him ghostwrite the book or if he just kind of helped him structure the book. Um, but I mean, later chapters, later chapters definitely are very, very meaty, very substantial, plenty of information there. First couple chapters, you know, you, you have to get through them. And that's, that's not horrible. That's just my, my honest review of the book. And that's not to say that there's nothing of substance in the book. So when we get to chapter two, if I can find it, the ultimate purpose of life. I was excited about this one because it seems like I meet people online sometimes who believe that survival of the fittest actually means just survive, just stay alive, just live. And uh, that's not what survival of the fittest meant. That's not what Darwin was talking about. He was talking about survival of the fittest so that the fittest may then go on and create more fit, uh, est, and those other fittest may live and create more. Um, survival of the fittest has no real meaning unless you take procreation into account. You survive, which is great, that's your first job, so that you can procreate, so that there will be more of you, so that your genes will continue into the next generation. Failing to do that, you might as well not have survived, which he kind of addresses. It's the harsh reality of, of biology. You will die, so you better procreate because some part of you will then continue to live, which is really fascinating and cool and awe-inspiring when you sit around thinking about it. But anyway, I digress. Um, so I was really excited about I was really excited about uh, chapter two. And then he got into fear of approach, approach anxiety, and the fear of reprisal. And that was kind of a hiccup for me. I looked at it and it was like, I don't know about that. Like the idea that men have this instinct to avoid rejection from women when they approach them because 
their ancient caveman ancestors might have gotten their skulls caved in by other ancient caveman ancestors if they approached the wrong woman or said the wrong thing to the wrong woman or got rejected by a woman who decided she didn't like them. I mean, for all I know, that's that's a really strongly supported idea and or, you know, a hypothesis or whatever that people have talked about a lot, that a lot of people believe that's just kind of taken for granted. I've never heard that idea before and it really didn't speak to me very much. I think the explanation is much more simple. I think that any rejection can be unpleasant. There was a study done, I'll leave a link in the description below, um, in the study, they were looking at people's brains while they were experiencing rejection, and they found that the areas of the brain that experience pain lit up when people were being rejected, which makes a lot of sense. Humans are social creatures. We rely on social connection with other human beings to survive. Um, as much as I love doomsday preppers, and I, I really kind of do love doomsday preppers, the thing they always fail to take into account is that we need other humans. We need that. We might, we might deny it up and down. We might say, oh no, I'm the most independent person in the world. But if your appendix bursts, it doesn't matter how independent you are. You need other humans to survive. There are so many levels and degrees to which we fail to take that into account. From food production to shelter to safety to diseases to clean drinking water there will always be things that we do not take into account that other humans are providing for us safety security what have you we every one of us as an individual needs other humans and to be rejected is i mean it's it's painful and it's a a, a dire warning against death to be rejected by the whole of the clan or the tribe or whatever human colony you live in, is death. And so, you know, to be rejected by a beautiful woman, a potential mate, um, that's, that's terrible, you know? It's not good on so many levels. On the one hand, you're rejected by a potential mate. What does that say about your mating possibilities? I mean, do you have many other potential mates lined up, or is this the only one? You're in trouble if this is the only one you were looking at. If you fail to procreate, you're dead. The you are the last one of you that will ever exist. There is no more of your genetics after you. So you have to successfully procreate. So you have to make it work with somebody. Maybe not this woman, but somebody. And if you haven't approached many women, or you don't have many potential mates lined up, and it falls through with this one, you're in trouble on a biological level as an individual. But rejection also hurts. So if anybody rejects you, it's going to sting Imagine if every single time you walk up to a beautiful woman and try to talk to her, you, you know, and, and, and for whatever reason she doesn't like you, you get a sharp, stinging electric shock. You know, not something that's going to fry your brains or make your hair stand on end, but definitely something unpleasant. How long is it going to be before you are dreading the idea of walking up to a beautiful woman and hitting on her? It's like, oh, okay, she's pretty. I'm going to try it. I need to try it because if I don't, I'm never going to procreate and also sex is really fun and it feels good. But that electric sting is not going to feel good. It is not going to be fun. Honestly, that electric sting is probably why there are so many MGTOW guys running around. They look at it and they say, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. They have a million good reasons to say that, although I still think they're wrong. But... It, it has nothing to do with, at least I think, it has nothing to do with, you know, ancient caveman ancestors and caveman social politics or anything like that. I think it's much simpler. Rejection stings. It's going to hurt. When you go talk to a beautiful woman, there is a decent chance that you will be hurt. Not on any kind of external societal level, but internally, it will be painful, which sucks. In order for you to be permitted the audience of a beautiful woman to attempt to attract her, you must first disqualify yourself from being considered a potential suitor by her. If you don't do that, she will assume by your approach alone that you're after her. I thought this was brilliant. I, I don't know if he's the first guy to talk about this, but I thought it was brilliant. Um, imagine that you are a bank. 
lending out money because this has been my experience, you know, walking around in strip clubs, walking around in bo- in bars. And I think this is something that would help men to understand a little bit better. Imagine that you have a thousand dollars in your pocket and you're some sort of bank and you can lend out that thousand dollars. That's the, you know, that that's what you do. That's what you have. That's what you're walking into a bar in. and you walk into a bar and suddenly every single person you talk to, and I'm not talking women because women are after your money, whatever, that's different. I'm talking about people that you might or might not have any kind of attraction to whatsoever. I'm talking about just people that you don't know, so you haven't built an attraction for them. And women, women are aroused mentally far more than they are visually. So a man, he looks at a woman, he makes an instant assessment. A woman, she looks at a man, she kind of gets a feeling for whether or not he's attractive. Sometimes it's like instant, oh my God, look at, look at those arms. Um, but sometimes it takes a little while for her to weigh him and judge him. So for a woman... Imagine that blank faces are coming at you. People that you haven't had enough time to really weigh and assess as a potential sexual partner. They're coming up to you and right away, can I borrow $1,000? Can I borrow $1,000? Hey, can I borrow $1,000? Hi, I, my name's Mike. Can I borrow $1,000? It would get so irritating. Like if, if you had $1,000 in your pocket and you walked into a bar and this was every single person who talked to you, you know, before too long, you would start thinking, oh, okay, you're only after my thousand dollars, aren't you? And this is what it can be like for women. A lot of the time, this is what it's like. You you go into a social setting and some guy walks up to you, you know, hi, my name is Mike. Right away you're sitting there going, hmm, hmm. You're being friendly to me right now because you want my thousand dollars, don't you? Like you want the thousand dollars that I've got in my pocket that I'm going to lend out to somebody sooner or later because I'm a bank and you haven't, you haven't really given me any kind of time to figure out whether or not you're a nice person. You're just, you're just here asking for the thousand dollars. It's like when people make the nice guy argument, but I'm such a nice guy. Imagine a bank having this kind of situation happen to them where somebody walks up to them and says, I need to borrow a loan for, you know, banks hand out generally more than a thousand dollars. So, you know, half a million, I need a loan for half a million. And the bank says, why should I give you the loan for half a million? Because I'm such a nice guy. Um, no, no, I'm not going to give you a loan for half a million dollars because you're a nice guy. Screw that. I mean, congratulations on being a nice guy. Now go away. Um, that's, that's what it's like for women. So if you're wondering what it's like for a woman when all these men approach her, why why women are so unfriendly, why they're so cruel, why they have all these defenses built in. It's because every single person that they meet when they walk into a bar is asking them for money. And it's like, come on, I just came in here to sit down and get a drink and kind of relax a little bit. And then maybe I'll look into that whole giving out a loan to somebody thing. But right now... You know, I don't even know your name. But yeah, imagine, imagine like just everybody coming up to you and asking like, you know, can I, can I borrow some money from you? It's like, have you submitted the proper paperwork yet? No. Go away. There's the door. No, no paperwork, no loan. You know, it gets to be like that. So this idea that you have to, you have to put a woman at ease. You have to convince her that you are not the guy who is coming up to her to pester her about borrowing the money that she's carrying in her pocket. You have to do that. You have to approach her with all the nonverbal cues. I am not actually coming here for your money. I am here to talk to you as a human being. I am here to be your friend. I am here to form a social connection with you. I am not here for your money. Um, that's important. Like... That's, that's very important. One of the things that I've really enjoyed about this book so far, I still have a few chapters left before I'm done, but one of the things that I've really enjoyed is that, you know, I didn't know exactly what I was getting into when I started reading this, but honestly, he lays out in great detail and with a great deal of insight, the structure of the formation of a relationship. He doesn't talk about the relationship, what's informed. He doesn't talk about, you know, 
the, the actual sexual acts all too much. I mean, though I haven't gotten to that chapter yet, so for all I know he does. We'll see. Um, he talks about the formation of the relationship. And that's the part that a lot of people get wrong. And that's the entire subject of the book. How to get beautiful women into bed. How to form a sexual relationship with a woman whom you are attracted to. And so this structure that he's describing is, is worth reading. Even if you're, even if you're a very uh, conservative Christian. Even if, you're, even if you're one of those stay a virgin till marriage kind of guys. This is still a worthwhile book to read. Not all of the advice might necessarily be the advice you want to follow. We'll get into that as we get to those chapters. But even if you're, if you're looking for a, a, a short-term quick lay, this is a book that will get you that. Like, this is a book that's designed around that idea. Like, I met the girl, I saw the girl, or I saw the girl across the bar, the girl looked attractive, I seduced the girl, and I went to bed with her. Okay. Um, but it also works for long-term relationships in the sense that this is the structure of the formation of a relationship. Really cool. And the very, very first step, no matter what you're doing, whether you're trying to just get the girl into bed for the night, I don't know how much I approve of that idea, but whatever. Um, we'll talk about the morals of this later when we get into some of the more morally questionable advice given by this book. Or if you're trying to actually build a long-term relationship with a girl, which is what I would more recommend. I mean, there's spinning plates for a while, but then there's long-term meaningful relationships. And I would assume it would be wise to approach any new relationship as potentially long-term and meaningful. Um, unless you're just looking at her and saying, well, she's cheap, easy harlot that I'm screwing tonight because I don't always understand men and sex sometimes, you know, bear with me guys. Um, the thing is the very first step always is I'm not trying to take your money. I am not convincing you to give me a loan. I'm not trying to sweet talk you into giving me that loan without filing the proper paperwork. So, yeah. I mean, so far, first two chapters, even though this is just intro stuff, even though this is just basically, um, hey, this is what the book is about, because the first two chapters really are just intro kind of stuff. At least that's what it seemed like to me. Um, intro and, you know, a few vocabulary words, a few core concepts, um, which I, I would recommend, you know, taking the time to read the book yourself and, you know, Maybe some of these concepts are going to be very new to you. That part in particular, though, really stood out to me as very important. Um, convince the woman that you are willing to get to know her as a friend and file the proper paperwork before asking her for the loan. <laughs> um, very important that you do that. All humans possess a built-in motivation to stay away from people with low or negative social value. In contrast, we may vastly improve our chances for survival and replication if we proactively seek out and form partnerships, both sexual and non-sexual, with those who offer us high survival and reproduction value. These people would include the rich friend who loaned you money when you were broke, the socially connected acquaintance who got you into the party, the buddy who protected you from that bully, the physically fit woman who had sex with you, even the mentor who taught you how to pick her up. Honestly, I think... I think we're slightly more social even than that. I don't think that there's always necessarily a a personal gain to be had from every social relationship you form. I understand that that's probably the root cause of the formation of most social relationships. So if you're looking at the very basic beginnings of humans forming social relationships, it probably was a survival-based kind of you give me this and I'll give you that kind of thing. But I think that Humans being social animals, we do sometimes form friendships just for entertainment value. Like, we've we've probably evolved past the point where it's like, you give me that and I'll give you this. Um, I think we've gotten to the point now where we seek out other human beings just for social companionship and entertainment. And so, as far as survival and reproduction value... Yeah, that's important, but sometimes it's good to just socialize. It's good practice to socialize with other human beings. If you do not socialize with other human beings, 
you fall out of practice, which is something I've experienced firsthand as a stay-at-home mom. It's not so good. But also it's great entertainment, and it, it, it just feels good. We are so socially wired, you know, in, inside of our minds, inside of our brains. We're so socially wired. We need the companionship of fellow humans just to stay sane and to stay centered. We need that to reassure ourselves that we're safe. So I don't think he's entirely right here where he says this because it's not tit for tat. It's, it's companionship. And survival and reproduction are definitely valuable things when weighing up a, ten, up a potential friend, but not all potential friends are offering us something more than what we have to gain. Um, sometimes they're just offering us entertainment. And entertainment is... Know, it feels good. Um, you know, I, <laughs> interestingly, a lot of guys who pick up girls and have sex with them, they're not doing it for reproductive value. They're doing it purely for entertainment. And uh, sometimes the women are doing it for entertainment too. <laughs> um, you do, I, I know that people do tend to gravitate toward people of, of similar social status. You know, you don't want to or similar social value, you know, somebody who's going to be, you know, entertaining at about the same level that you're entertaining or offer the same level of entertainment that you're offering in a social kind of setting. Because if you offer somebody who, who does give you that negative value, so say you, you're trying to make friends with somebody who's aggressive and, you know, short tempered and addicted to harmful chemicals you know, that's not the sort of person you're going to want to be making friends with most of the time if you're a healthy, well-adapted individual. I've known, <laughs> I've made friends with plenty of those people, but let's face it, I wasn't in a good place in my life at that time. Um, you don't, you don't necessarily want to maintain friendships with those people because they cause more problems for you than they, than they ever solve by way of, you know, giving you stuff or just simple entertainment and companionship value. It's like, I get this amount of companionship value from this person and then they make me so miserable that it's just not worth it um so i mean yeah that's just something that i noticed something that i thought about while reading that section yeah there are a few things where i look at it and it's like i don't really think this is exactly how things work or how people work but you know the the core concepts the ideas yeah, I, I definitely got to say I agree with those. I think it's, I think, I think this is wonderful because it is, it is the structure of the formation of a relationship. Any relationship, you take a relationship and you just toss it under this template, it fits. I would say most, if not all relationships fit this template. So it's good to know the template. Um, but that's it. That's, that's the first two chapters already. It's been pretty brief, but you know, the first two chapters, core concepts, vocabulary, and ideas. It's not going to be as meaty as later chapters were. Anyway, next week we will be talking about chapters three and four. Um, I look forward to seeing you all then. Talk to you guys later. I almost forgot, because this is a relatively short book, I'm going to be starting up the poll for the next book that I will be reading right now and that way I can get as many comments and have as many of you guys weighing in as possible to get the book that you are all most interested in hearing. Um, a lot of these are suggestions that you guys have given me that seemed really interesting so here goes. There is The Art of Seduction by Robert Greene, No More Mr. Nice Guy by Dr. Robert Glover, Survival of the Prettiest by Nancy Etcoff, Hormonal, The Hidden Intelligence of Hormones by Maddie Hasselton, and lastly, just for shits and giggles, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. No, we won't be reading the, the book so much as just looking at the different plot points and elements that make up the ultimate female fantasy and just kind of trying to figure out what the ultimate female fantasy is. Um, that one will probably make me squirm a lot, not because of anything particularly scandalous in the book, but because of the very poor quality of the writing. Yeah, uh, please vote and tell me what you want to hear next. So throughout the book, um, Mystery regularly refers to his website, mysterymethod.com, 
and um, talks about how a lot of people will meet on the forums and they'll discuss new ways to pick up girls and new ways to attract women. And so finally, after reading like the third or fourth or maybe the fifth um, invitation to go to mysterymethod.com for more information, I went to mysterymethod.com to see what was up. And uh, I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this, but here we go. All right, mysterymethod.com. It is, it is for sale if, uh, if you want to buy the domain name. So if you ever want to start up a website talking about the methods behind uh, writing mystery novels, um, it's going to be kind of pricey. 